So one of the things that we're all in agreement about is um, that SOPA and Protect IP, for some reason I just hate the term PIPA, it sounds like Pippi Longstock, um, that this was a watershed moment uh, in internet and IP legislation because it's the first time that the content industries came to Congress, wanted something more in terms of protection and in terms of enforcement, and were rebuffed. And in many ways, the shock and anger of proponents, people like Chris Dodd, who said in effect afterwards, don't come to us for campaign contributions anymore, um, is really sort of emblematic of this, is that they just, this had never happened to them before. But one of the things that I think is important is that this is not the last battle, right? So this is not even over yet. Chris Dodd has said that they're working behind the scenes to try to build some sort of tech-friendly version of SOPA or Protect IP. And we see that there's a history of this, right? So it started with Koika, and then it became Protect IP, and then it became SOPA. And they're also moving on parallel tracks with things like the Six Strikes Copyright Enforcement Scheme that's being rolled out to your ISPs this summer. Um, and so what I want to do is to ask our panelists straight off, um, we're not going to do introductions, you have their names, um, is just to say, imagine for the moment that um, we give you a time machine, right? So we hack one together this afternoon, and we go back to sort of September or October of 2011. This is where Lamar Smith and his staff are drawing up the Stop Online Piracy Act. Knowing what you know now about how this debate played out, what advice would you give them? Sherwin, we'll start with you. Well, I, I guess, you know, if I'm going to be a little bit cynical, I'd say um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, you know, because, you know, we're talking about September, uh, September October of 2011. Uh, you know, Protect IP, PIPA, had been in the works, you know, for a while before that, as you said, quite good before that. We'd been criticizing those, uh, uh, and significantly, we'd, uh, talk to, we'd talk to House staffers as well, saying, you know, there are these problems with the Senate bill, make sure you don't repeat them in the House bill. Um, and they said, oh, okay, we won't. And they went on to make, like, far, far broader and stranger and worse mistakes in SOPA. And actually, that seemed to catch the attention of a lot more people, not just because it was a much worse bill, but because those particular mistakes that they made indicated that they weren't listening uh, to, to what technologists were saying, that they weren't paying attention to the structure of the internet, and they weren't taking these things, they weren't doing their jobs as, uh, as, as sort of thoughtful uh, stewards of the legislation. So that, I, I think, generated much more of the upset and got much more political involvement from the grassroots than we would have had otherwise. So to be perfectly cynical about it, I'm not sure I would have changed a thing. Great. I have to say that, you know, the, the, your story really resonates is that in many ways, if you look at it, sort of SOPA was to protect IP. Like, if you imagine that you took Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, right, the latest of the, or the, the first of the prequels, and you added in, like, another half hour of Jar Jar Binks, that's basically what SOPA <laughs> was to Pippa. Okay, so let me start off by saying that I'm Lon Jacobs, and until June of last year, I was general counsel of News Corp. So when I was invited to a hackathon, I was a little confused. <laughs> anyway, I figured out this is a legal hackathon. All right, so the question is how, what, we, what we should have done for, to make SOPA better. So we are establishing as a premise that piracy is bad. Where we disagree is the impact of that piracy, um, for example, I think um, Tim Wu described piracy as a, roughly equivalent to mosquitoes swarming around the media companies. Not, not really that big of a problem, whereas I think the media companies would say that, well, it may not be an existential threat, it certainly does threaten the jobs of thousands of hardworking middle class Americans. Um, and there's also, now the major disagreement is on what the necessary weapons are to combat piracy, whether SOPA was, in effect, a mosquito net or a neutron bomb. Um, so what I wanted to do is go through what I think were the three major problems of SOPA. First was the private right of action, which also had uh, some concerns about due process. And there was also the vague drafting. Um, my favorite was that a violation, it would be a violation of SOPA if a US-directed site is taking or has taken deliberate actions to avoid confirming a high probability of the U.S. directed site to carry out acts that constitute a violation. So you could understand why a company like YouTube would be very upset claiming that this eviscerates the safe harbor of DMCA. And then three was the specter of censorship that 
users would not know which, um, which sites were being blocked or why, which obviously leads to a number of concerns about abuse and overreaching. So I thought that what we would do is start, let's look at what existing laws and proposed laws there are around SOPA. We have DMCA, which has morphed into DMCA+, Plus, which I think most people think is working pretty well, with the possible exception of Viacom, which is continuing with its lawsuit. Um, but that filtering works, but it does not accomplish what SOPA was intended to accomplish, which was to get at these foreign websites. Um, we have the existing law enforcement agencies, which are doing effective work. They've shut down mega upload. So there's, there's that. And then there's what you mentioned, the six strikes, the graduated response, which does not raise, raise the issue of censorship, does not raise the issue of due process or vagueness, but it doesn't really go after the pirate sites, it's really going after the end users and not the real villains in this. So now, so what I thought, well, there's a, new, there's a new statute that's floating around Congress now called CISPA, which is to attack cybersecurity. Here, the difference is that involvement is voluntary and that there's complete immunity for the internet companies that cooperate. And not surprisingly, all of those internet companies who are concerned about your constitutional rights of free speech aren't really concerned about your constitutional right to privacy, mostly because these are the companies that make a lot of money. The more money they make, the less privacy you have. Um, so, I don't. Just as a starting point, maybe the way to go at SOPA is you take out the private right of action, you stick with the government right of action, with support from the private companies who are Im immunized from liability. That's that would be my starting point. That's right. And, and thanks also for mentioning CISPA, right? So this is one thing that um, one of the sort of strange things is that um, this uh, particular tool was put in place for IP, and it's a little bit odd, right? So we had the discussion about Craigslist and sex trafficking, and there's kid porn out there, and there's terrorism speech and all these other things. And what we want to do to censor the Internet is for IP enforcement. It's very, very sort of strange conceptually. Eric, go ahead. My name is Eric Gardner. I write for a Hollywood Reporter. I write about entertainment and media legal issues, and I suppose that if Back in the day, I had a, a time machine to go back and speak to Lamar Smith. Uh, the conversation could run a, a few different ways, depending on my capacity for being there. If I was there in the capacity of advising him as, as, as just a political leader about what he should do, I would probably say, it, the conversation might go, you know, Lamar, and, and may I call you that? And he'd say, no. I'd say, <laughs> and, and I'd say okay, Senator. And, and, what what could what could sorry representative what could we do to make make this better and i and basically i'd say don't bother you, you, there's absolutely nothing you can do uh you know intellectual property there's not going to be much uh, much upside um to, to this issue and there's going to be tremendous uh downside uh there, there's absolutely nothing you can do that that is going to placate everyone so that, that would be my advice to him just politically, and I'm sure he'd probably ignore it. Uh, if I was there representing Hollywood, and I often write uh, to a Hollywood audience, I, uh, I might give him a little bit, I might give them a little bit different advice. Now, when most people think about the evils of SOPA, they, uh, you know, the, the primary, the biggest uh, negative was always the, the DNS blocking, you know, the censorship idea. Um, but to me, I don't think that's why SOPA failed. Um, I, I think that, that SOPA failed because um, there was a very good um, uh, picture in people's heads that the favorite websites that they were, in, that they were going to, uh, Facebook or Reddit, were, were going to be shut down um, and, and, and that it did all sorts of new sort things like uh, sent, and that might send Justin Bieber to jail and all, and all that. Which would be a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. The unintended uh, benefits of SOPA, I, I suppose. So uh, what, what I would say to, the, uh, say to Lamar Smith if I was representing Hollywood is, look, I think you could actually keep the DNS blocking. I think that you can keep the the stuff where where uh, that cuts off the money supply to, to foreign websites. I even think you can, can keep the streaming uh, stuff. Uh, the only thing that that you really need to change is all the all the all that language about search engines and facilitating um, the the injunctive stuff. That's the and that's the sort of thing that 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 that's caused 
Google and, and Facebook and uh, you know a lot of the, the uh, intellectual leaders of the, the technology community to, to, to say this is this is too much. Now I, I have no doubt that, that there's a lot of, a lot else in SOPA which is uh, which is uh, terrible to, to many uh, technology technology leaders. But I believe that if you had just gotten rid of the the the, uh, the burdens that that would be presented to ISPs, that that uh, the legislation probably would probably would have passed. Uh, now the third the third thing is if I was there just you know speaking on behalf of you know the population at large us in the room you know we we uh, what's what, what's good um, honestly I'm not sure what I would say because uh, I think these are tricky questions and and um, I, I I don't think that that we have clear answers on, on what. Uh, needs to be done about piracy. Uh, I, I probably that probably means that that uh, you know it, it's important to take some time to think about these issues. To uh, you know do the sort of crowdsourcing approach that that was presented earlier here. Um, um, I think that that a lot of the, the questions um, on, on some of the previous IP legislation, like the Digital Millennium Co Copyright Act, haven't yet been figured out, and and it might. Uh, makes sense uh, to uh, you know um, spend some time with the courts to actually figure out how that's happening. Uh, I think that that uh, a lot of the enforcement issues are, aren't particularly clear. I think that that uh, you know there are things that that are potentially criminal. There are, are ways that that uh, the executive branch could do more on on piracy um, and. You know, there's all sorts of questions hanging out there about, about injunctive relief uh, already at the disposal of judges. So uh, I, I think those uh, sorts of issues might need to be answered first before we, we get into what's what's going to happen next. Um, so that's basically would be my uh, program. Great, thanks. I also just want to pitch the question tool. Um, so we're going to take at least the last 10 minutes or so, and I'll just ask questions from here, right? So this is, is crowd participation, right? As geeks, it would make people nervous to do this in person, but you can type safely on the screen. It's minimal social interaction, um, and so we'll, we'll go with that. Hi, my name is Amit Eckstein, a technology attorney at Moses and Singer. Um, I think, you know, I would look first to, uh, well, I would recommend that you first look to the existing laws and say, okay, how is DMCA not addressing this? Okay, well, this is an international issue that you're concerned about. Well, isn't that where treaty law comes into play? And maybe shouldn't we look at WIPO or some of the existing IP treaties that are out there to seek enforcement um, and let local governments take on uh, problems in foreign jurisdictions? We have a whole network of laws that are out there. Um, and if you know DMCA applied on a foreign basis um, might work if they're ancillary, and we certainly have trade um, various ways to put pressure on countries that don't comply um, with their WIPO obligations. So I think that's a kind of a high level look. Um, you know, part of that same idea is, is how is this a new? And, and this really, this problem of copyright infringement isn't that new, really. I mean, it's since copyright has been around, there's been copyright jurisdiction, uh, copyright infringement in foreign jurisdictions. And the copyright owners have always complained that I'm losing a market. And, and to me, as a counselor, you know, it's an interesting thing to say, well, are, are you losing revenue by this act? Like, if we were to stop this, would the people that you stop actually go out and buy your product? Or are you stopping this because you're controlling your IP? And, and there's an interesting balance there just on a broad issue, whether you want to um, stop this infringing use that may actually um, create a fan base that later on those folks might actually be able to buy your product and buy... Enfor taking enforcement action now, you're actually ostracizing future customers. Um, and, and you see that in a lot of different industries where I don't think the copyright owners understand what they're doing when they go after actual users. Um, uh, that goes, I guess, to the uh, posting the link part of it. Another part of the posting the link was this, um, there wasn't a knowledge qualifier in there. It was just you post the link and, and you could be on the hook. And even in you know, like the flea market cases where people are held for contributory infringement, the, the, there was a whole analysis done on whether the flea market owner knew that they were counterfeits that were being sold. 
Um, and, and that was absolutely a part of the contributory infringement in, in the flea market type setting. Um, let's see. Um, I guess a, another question would be, how would this impact innovation? And looking at, um, you know, Google, Facebook, YouTube, even Napster, you know, successful and unsuccessful business models and say, well, if, if this had been out there when Google was coming online in whatever it was, 96, 97, 98, whenever that was right then, would, would this Google have actually existed or would you have shut it down in the first few weeks? And, and I think the answer would have been there wouldn't be a Google and how different would our world be now if we didn't have that? Similarly, you know, Napster might have been shut down a lot quicker, but I don't think we would have gotten the benefit of seeing that music can be distributed in, in an efficient way and people you know, using iTunes as an example, will pay a dollar for music, and there's actually a real market out there for it. Um, and then um, also looking at, you know, who are the constituents that are driving this, and are they rational? You know, I, I, RIAA, you know, not to besmirch, but in their um, complaint against LimeWire, asked for $75 trillion in damages. That's more than the U.S. GDP by several uh, multiples. I don't actually know the number, but... So that they were asking, I think they said, more money that actually existed in circulation was their uh, actual claim for damages. And, and the judge said that was absurd. And, and so it's, you know, are you dealing with constituents that are asking for legislation that are seeking solely to protect their own interests or seeking, you know, to better, um, you know, copyright and the constitutionality of copyright, which is to promote the arts, right, innovation? Not to protect the copyright holders, it's to promote the arts. And, and so, um, you know, I protect content, I, at my job, day to day, is to protect content owners. But, you know, when you step back and you look at what this is about, I think that um, we've really lost sight, you know, in drafting this kind of legislation about what, what you're trying to protect and the right way to do it. It, America has a sort of ironic history in this. Charles Dickens actually went on a speaking tour here to protest uh, infringement of his books, which were not eligible for copyright at the time, right? So America for a long time was a pirate nation, which is kind of fun. Michael? Yeah, there's a great book on that by Adrian Johns. Um, I, uh, Michael Mandelberg, I come here not as uh, a lawyer or uh, a business person or really a technologist, although I wear that hat. Um, I come here as an artist. Um, I am the creative on the table. And you actually set up very nicely by talking about how um, copyright is intended uh, to encourage people to publish, to encourage uh, the creators to make their work part of the public. And as part of that, um, it is to return to the, the, the commons and the public domain. Over the, I would, I would say to, I would, so I would say, with that as a setup, I mean, you know that. You're mo probably mostly lawyers in the audience. I would say two things um, to, the, to the representative. I would say, you know, in the long run, do you really want to be on the side uh, of, of this that is um, trying to keep the genie in the bottle to, to cite what somebody else said earlier? This is a disruptive technology that is changing the way in which uh, information is being transmitted, culture is taking place, uh, as well as business is, 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 is taking place. Um, and it, it's, you know, just I like to think in metaphors, they often reduce things to a level where it's not totally correct, but like, do you really want to be representing the horse dealers when the horseless carriage comes out to try to legislate the horseless carriage into illegality to preserve the interests of another group? It's more complicated than that, but that's what I would say on a certain level. There are other options. The EFF has proposed uh, voluntary collective licensing, et cetera. So there are other options other than trying to legislate the genie back into the bottle, during which you make, you know, which I would also say the sort of second point is you make culture illegal. Um, culture, creativity, uh, is about borrowing. It's about remixing. It is about uh, building upon the ideas of others. Um, and we could look to somebody like Lessig, uh, who talks about the way in which that's transpiring now uh, in, in the remix, um, which is about what he's really talking about is a shift in the way in which people write. 
he's arguing that writing is actually happening in a different way. We don't just quote by, uh, you know, by borrowing some sentences and putting quotation marks around them. We actually are quoting video because we now can all edit video or we're, we're compositing images together, etc. But you can go back further than that. You could go back another 20 years to someone like Frederick Jameson who talks about postmodernism and the idea that all culture at this point is an act of citation and pastiche and compositing. But you could go back further than that. You could go back to Picasso. And Picasso, who's pretty famously said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. Um, Picasso, one of the great geniuses of the, you know, the unique and, and, and individual geniuses uh, of the 20, 20, uh, 20th century of modernism, saying, everything I got, I stole. Um, you know, you go back to Manet, you go back to the Romans, it's all there. So don't make culture illegal. Great. So it's worth noting, too, that um, another irony is that um, many of, for example, Disney's films, especially their early films, were built on things like fairy tales that had just fallen into the public domain, right? So there's a little bit of chutzpah there of sort of taking something and saying, mine, mine. Um, so lastly, Wendy, so those of you who've taken internet law with me, Wendy Seltzer's fight with the NFL is basically a crash course in how Section 512 of the DMCA works. So she's sort of an expert on this. Wendy, take it away. Uh, thanks. So, so I want to begin with another uh, Lessig reference to uh, what could be the motto of a legal hackathon, uh, that code is law. And uh, so the, the problem with uh, Asopa and Apipa is trying to reshape the code uh, in service of a law that doesn't really work for uh, the way all of the other parts of code work, uh, trying to, to break some of the, the architectural uh, hearts of the internet in uh, changing the way the, the domain name system works, ignoring all of the places that code reconfigures itself around uh, those breakages and, uh, and, and finds new ways to continue the communication that, uh, that, that code uh, allows. So one of the great things about the internet is that it's lowered the costs of communication. Uh, that in turn has lowered the costs of uh, collaboration and collaborative creation uh, and innovation. Um, and uh, I liken it to uh, an immune response uh, that the internet and its co collaborative possibilities then uh, find ways around uh, some of the, the, the legal and technical impositions uh, that would break those communicative ties because uh, SOPA and PIPA, while uh, targeted at uh, rogue sites or unlawful activity, uh, really threatened communication pathways and without very much due process uh, gave the oppor uh, opportunity to, to shut down uh, sites and if the cost was uh, lawful non-infringing speech, uh, well, th that was just a, a, a cost of protecting copyrights. Um, so how can code respond to, uh, to these challenges in ways that, that bolster law? Um, well, one way, I think, is through enforcing transparency uh, by providing uh, hooks for citizen engagement by providing uh, opportunities for the we government that Andrew Roche mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, so um, one way that I've tried to, to work with that is through the Chilling Effects Project uh, over at chillingeffects.org. Uh, we try to pro provide transparency into the uh, DMCA notice and takedown process uh, and to other uh, exercises of uh, legal claims over online expression. If you've sent a cease and desist notice, um, it might wind up on chilling effects because we invite people to send us cease and desist notices that they've received. Uh, we post them, we uh, annotate them with the help of students at law school clinics around the country. Uh, and we allow people to understand the claims that are being made that result in the removal of online speech. Uh, the greatest number of those comes from uh, Google, which receives uh, more than a thousand takedown notices a day now. Uh, 
from people alleging that sites in Google web search or images or posts on Google Blogger or applications in the Google uh, marketplace infringe on copyrights. Under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, Google responds by taking those things down, but rather than just making them disappear, it posts them to chilling effects where when you do a search, uh, you see at, sometimes at the bottom of your search results, uh, results have been removed from your search uh, because of a request to Google under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This provides a sort of feedback loop. This is a way for people to see how the law is being used uh, and then to take action if the law is being misused. If people see that a result that they should have gotten uh, has been disappeared because of a legal complaint and don't think that that's a proper complaint, uh, they can file counter notifications if it was their content removed. Um, they can file protests about the law uh, if it was somebody else's content that they think was, was wrongly removed, but that person uh, hasn't felt the confidence to counter notify. Uh, they can, if they wish, engage in their own forms of civil disobedience by mirroring the content and uh, finding other ways to call attention to it. Uh, it's even become referred to as the, the Streisand effect online after a famous case where Barbara Streisand uh, demanded the removal of some photographs in a uh, California coastline database uh, that included photographs of her uh, seaside house. Um, she sent a takedown notice. Uh, the, the photographer posted this notice, called attention to it, and many, many more people saw the notice and the photographs of uh, Barbara Streisand's mansion after she sent the takedown threat than before. Uh, he ended up winning a, uh, an anti-slap, uh, anti-strategic uh, lawsuit against public participation uh, lawsuit because it was a frivolous claim on her part. Uh, but this, in turn, helps people to, to reset the sending of takedown notices. It's not costless to send a takedown uh, if, you're, uh, if you're in the wrong. Uh, and so through these kinds of transparency co uh, code efforts, uh, we can sort of make the law more granular, give people more options to engage with it and more options to, to call out the problems and uh, identify solutions. And maybe through this we can also give copyright holders uh, additional ways to, uh, to find internet friendly ways of, of making money and sharing and redistributing uh, and selling their products, not just trying to stomp out the distribution uh, that others are making. Great. So I want to um, I want to come to the live question tool, and I want to uh, frame it in in two ways. One is that um, Hollywood, generally, if I think of content producing industries, has fought against every new distribution technology since the age of the player piano roll. So uh, it's only because of um, a Ninth Circuit case that your MP3 player is lawful. They tried to go after Diamond Rio. Um, Jack Valenti of the MPAA famously said that the VCR was to the American movie industry what the Boston Strangler was to a woman home alone. Um, right, and so, uh, so in framing that up, uh, one thing I want to think about is business models, and it turns out that essentially innovation, at least in the last 15 years, has never come from Hollywood. Right, we never got effective music distribution until Apple stepped in, right? So we had press play and music now, and they were a joke. They didn't work, and they weren't consumer friendly, and they were DRM bound. We didn't really get effective ebook distribution until Amazon and Barnes and Noble got into this space. And we um, never got really sort of effective streaming music until Spotify came along. And so the question here is, isn't part of the problem Hollywood's business models? Um, in this crowd, I actually think that that's, there's probably a fair amount of consensus on that. So I also want to frame it the opposite way, which is to say, okay, now you have Amazon and iTunes and Spotify, so you can get music from anywhere from 99 cents a song to free, and yet piracy hasn't gone away. So what changes um, does Hollywood need to make in order to, um, and, and contract producers more generally, to um, help solve this problem? Sherwin, we'll start with you again. Sorry. That's all right. No. By the way, I'm Sherwin C. I'm Deputy <laughs> Legal Director of Public Knowledge. Um, but I, actually, you know, I do want to go straight at this question that, that Neo's asked. Does anyone think it would be possible to bring the content industry to the table to craft a nuanced piece of legislation? I think and the, a, a response to that 
is that there's, it's been done through private agreement and it began at the iTunes store. I think this is interesting uh, in, in that it points a little bit towards some of the, the solutions that you've been talking about in terms of new business models and new ways of doing things. But I think there's an inherent limitation in that because there's only so many things you can do with, given business, with existing business models so long as the law is the way it is. So there, there do need to be conversations about <coughs> changes to the law or, and changes in the way that the law is applied. And I think it's entirely possible for there to be nuanced conversations about that. And there actually have been a lot of nuanced conversations about that. The question is, are those nuanced conversations the same conversations that are had in the room between lobbyists and staffers? I don't think they are. Are those nuanced conversations taking place in the presence of those staffers? I don't think they are. And there's, I think, a structural problem, a uh, reason that that's not happening. It's not simply a, uh, it's not simply people being stupid and stubborn. Uh, it's people being stubborn because there is a distinct and inherent advantage to that. Because if you give ground and the other guy doesn't, uh, you lose. Well, I, I, have, I, I would go at this in a couple of ways. I'm, I'm a little outnumbered here, but I'm going to try it anyway. Um, there, are, there are situations, I, I grant you, if you read Timu's book, you see piracy and the efforts to fight piracy throughout the 20th century. But there are some situations where copyright law had to be changed in order to protect the, the, the rights of the artists. So when the phonograph was invented, someone had to help the songwriters, and so the law was changed. When cable was created, the, the, the uh, courts had to step in and new legislation had to be passed in order to protect the networks from losing, from providing their signal to the cable companies for free. Now, I will grant you that, that throughout history, media companies have gone kicking and screaming to the next level. So when radio was created, the newspapers were convinced they were going to go out of business because their newspapers were being read over the radio. Same happened every step of the way, and I, and I grant that. And I think that the media companies are learning their lesson slowly, too slowly, but what we're what the media companies are no longer focusing on fair use. They, they grant fair use is, is not something where they need to focus. I think the media companies are slowly learning that it, they'd rather not go after the end user. They'd rather go after the significant pirate sites. And I think we have to remember that I don't think there's anyone who, there are very few people that would protect these organizations who are commercial enterprise based on solely on stealing someone else's content. And that's what the media companies wanted to do with SOPA. Granted, it was done very poorly. And, but it still doesn't mean that they are completely wrong when they say we want to prevent those, the pirate bays of the world from making money simply by stealing someone else's content. So I actually think this, uh, we had Al Perry from Paramount Pictures here this week, um, and one of the things he was talking about that I think is, is possibly a sort of zone of, of um, compromise is the idea that if we focus, I knocked over my soda, if we focus on um, large-scale commercial exploitation, right, so we don't worry about remixes or mashups, but we just think about what we think of as pure mass piracy, that actually may be a sort of good way to begin the conversation. I also want to thank you for being here as sort of the, the content side. As a, as a Red Sox fan who lives in Brooklyn, I feel your pain, right? So... Um, <laughs> Eric, go ahead. Well, I think I have a real problem with, with presenting things in, in such black and white ways. And, and I, I, I kind of get the sense, you know, when I'm here, that's what I'm hearing a lot. And trust me, if I was in a, a Hollywood panel with a lot of Hollywood people and they were saying, oh, you know, SOPU is needed and, and, you know, piracy is terrible, I'd feel uncomfortable there as well. Um, yeah, a couple, a, a couple issues. Number one, you know, people talk about Hollywood versus technology, the media industry. Can we bring them to the table? And I say, why, why are you using the, a singular word here? There are lots of different people in, in, in the media industry, and, uh, and they have lots of different agendas. And some people are, are open-minded, and some people are closed-minded. The, the other thing I would say is, you know, just the word innovation, which, it, which has suddenly become some catch-all phrase. Now, um, you know, is it innovative that, that a lot of these tech companies collect uh, and these 
uh, private information about you? Is it innovative that, that we're moving to, to a, a society where instead of paying for content, you're, we're, we're being inundated by, by lots of advertising and commercials? And, and you know, is, is that supposed to be progress? Um, and and I, I feel like the law creates incentives towards how, how we operate. And a lot of times when we talk about progress and where we need to go, we're talking about quantitative issues and business models, but, but rarely do we talk about qualitative uh, innovation and, and, you know, what kinds of speech do we want and, and what, you know, what are, is going to incentivize uh, our artists to, to build great content and just instead of just, you know, content that, that people will pay for. And I, I feel like that's really missing from, from the conversation and needs to be uh, discussed a lot more. Anyway. So um, I guess I would look at just from, from a high level, the content owner versus the, um, versus the creator of the content and looking at, um, in, you know, for music, you have the publishing companies and the libraries out there. Um, and, you know, these are, you know, from a publishing company, like let's say a Sony, who's like in real trouble now with not only their uh, music library, but their technology in general. They're failing to innovate, and to, to use your <laughs> word. But, you know, you look at them and you say, well, you're not doing anything new. You're taking other people's creations and you've purchased them and now you're seeking to, to monetize them. But if you were to go and speak to those artists, what, what would they say, you know, when, when they created it? You see a lot of artists now are actually not even going the publishing company route and are keeping things in house and are saying, here, take my music. We understand that if you take the music and you, you share it with your friends, you're actually going to come to a concert or you're going to actually buy the music from us. So I think um, the industry is holding on to a business model that um, has failed and hasn't unfortunately hasn't found a way to monetize it effectively. I mean, you see the New York Times, Wall Street Journal trying to move to, you know, 10 clicks free a month and then you're going to start paying. It'll be interesting to see how that evolves and if people are going to start paying um, or do searches and try to deep link in instead, you know, and, and there's so many ways around all the technologies that they, they put out there. Um, I had one other thought that I was locked. Um, actually, that's, that's really it. Michael, you uh, I would just say we, we keep talking about I, I would just say that we keep talking about content and the content industry and, and I would I would encourage us to think about culture um, culture is not a set of content culture is a process uh, and it's how we constitute a society thanks I was just going to to uh, call attention to, to Nina Paley's tweet saying uh, very much the same thing, that uh, stop referring to a few legacy companies as the content industry. Everyone is the content industry now. Uh, and I think everyone is culture now uh, would, would, would also work, that what we're trying to do as a society uh, is encourage the, the communication and the uh, entertaining one another and uh, <coughs> we need to look at the places where that is working well uh, on the internet and with new technology uh, and encourage the laws to, to help those rather than get in the way. Uh, and rather than looking backward, let's look forward at the artists who are finding homes on Kickstarter and the artists who are self-distributing their material uh, and the artists who are managing to make uh, big productions despite the fact that people can go and copy them afterwards. Uh, and uh, and look at uh, the places where where that's working successfully and encourage it rather than uh, the places where uh, it's failing and trying to to uh, to shore up the the levee after it's been breached and uh, the water's all rushed downstream. Unfortunately, I think that um, lobbyists are paid for by the content industry, and that the culture as a whole isn't paying for lobbyists to write. And, and push legislation through. So I, I guess, you know, to, I guess on the keynote was anyone could write legislation. Unfortunately, no one's writing legislation except people who are losing money. Um. Well, we're a nonprofit, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
no, I, actually, I just thought there was something interesting that Eric said, and that uh, that shows up uh, on this this question about uh, you know if if make consumers feel they have a vested interest in the product uh, if there's public financing or a Kickstarter model. I think there's there's you know something interesting in this. Uh, you know, would would people have kickstarted uh, the Battleship movie? I mean, I, I I don't I don't actually think so. I mean. There, there's a question of there is questions there are questions of quality of, of what you know what we want to see but I think the problem the, the the scary thing when you ask that question is who is making that decision to 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 create those incentives and it's not just a matter of what content but also what distribution mechanisms and this is what we're talking about when we're talking about innovation it's not um, it's not necessarily to create a free for all but certainly you don't want to not just pick winners and losers, but make your decisions based upon existing technology and existing models. I mean, I, one of my colleagues likes to joke when people ask him what it is he does for a living, he says, um, you know, I, I protect the rights of unborn, uh, unborn technologies. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's, it's, it's really important to know that we are not going to anticipate the next killer app, killer distribution method, uh, but we want to make sure that the structures we have in place are future-proof enough to do that. Uh, the existing structures that we have in Title 17 are starting to show their age and their cracks at the seams, especially when you have something like Section 106 that places a legal, a legal hook, a liability hook on the making of a copy when anything digital is copied gazillions of times, probably to no real legal effect. Um, you know, all of the buffer copies that are made copies that are made in RAM, in caches, that don't diminish sort of any value to the, to the copyright holder. Um, those are all potential legal hooks, and that shows you that the structures we have, that we had in 1976, aren't fitting. Well, at the, at the risk of sounding like a cliche, you have to remember that everyone's talking about media companies being dragged into the 21st century, but you're asking them to be dragged into a marketplace where they're competing with free, where they're competing with pirate sites that don't pay anything for the content. And they're trying that. The music company is, is innovating pretty well these days, but the media companies have Hulu. The only reason Hulu exists is because they have to come up with a business model that competes with free. And, you know, it's, you, there are statutes that are, that are out of date and need to be adjusted, and this is a give and take. But I do think people have to remember that the artists who create the content aren't going to be compensated for their content if they're competing against free. And there has to be some compromise. I don't hear a lot of compromise on, on this panel today. I mean, I, and when, when we talk about media companies, I, I think that, the, uh, that the, the industry at large has, has done itself a little bit of a disservice by, by throwing out these abstract numbers like 19 million <laughs> jobs lost. I, 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 don't, I just don't think that's a, a clear picture for, for people. Um, you know, there are people, there are artists who work within media uh, companies and, and, you know, they do struggle, and especially up and coming ones. Um, the other thing I would say is that I think it's impossible not to to uh, to create uh, incentives. Whatever we have um, is is going to to stimulate some form of of, uh, of of art, and it's going to gear 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 art and and expression in in a certain direction. And if we stand back and say uh, that that there should be no laws and, and less structure, then then. You know, perhaps art and expression moves towards a, a populist direction. And if we if we decide, oh, uh, oh we, we want we want commercial expression to be to be of more use, and we, and, and we we do this uh, statute and and that law, um, it'll be it'll be moved there. But but what I'm trying to say is that this, uh, that the structure is always there, whether whether you, whether you believe it or not. And uh, the, just because there's there's no SOPA, and even if we repealed all the laws, it w it would gear um, art in a, in a, in a certain in a certain direction, and it might not it might not be towards innovation. Um, you know, innovation is just something that 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 is just a label that we we put on um, we put on it. It's it's qualitative, and we might not want judges uh, determining uh, you know what what's great art, and we might not want our lawmakers to do it and do it either. But it, it, you know, these sorts of things happen. 
So uh, we need to wrap up for lunch, but I want to leave you with, with two thoughts. The first is that um, we, even in a world of piracy, everyone admits that we're going to get content. We're going to have cultural production. And the question is what kind of cultural production we want, right? So we, we may not necessarily want John Carter or Transformers 3, but I remember a few years ago in the Oscar debates, it was pointed out that the most popular movie that year by sheer voting by people who bought tickets was Alien vs. Predator. Right? So we have to remember that. These are things that people enjoy and people like. And that the, this, um, there's a diversity out there. Right? There are people who create video games and software and origami and quilts. And all of them have some interest in this debate. And that's what I want to close it with, which is that's what we're trying to do here with Hack the Act. Right? We're trying to have the conversations that Sherwin was mentioned and to bring them out into the open and to try to have a much more sort of nuanced and varied conversation about how to arrive at a balance and how to get to the compromises that Lon mentioned. And so with that, please join me in thanking our panelists.